Markle here in time to get a donut. And uh, <clears throat> we hope you'll enjoy the program, uh, given that this gentleman's ex-Air Force. I have to give him a little bit of credit for those <laughs> of us that are in. And uh, we're going to do a multi-service thing here. I'm going to introduce Mike, U.S. Army, and he'll do the admin. And then he's going to introduce John, U.S. Navy, and he'll do the next piece of it. And eventually we'll get to the speaker. <laughs> so without further ado, Mike, you got it. Thanks, Lou. And thank you all for joining us for our 178th Coffee and Conversation. Uh, and again, all have been marvelous in the stories from everyone that we've heard uh, about their service to our country, I think is so important for us to remember and preserve. Uh, now, what I'd like to do is just before we get going, a couple admin announcements. Uh, first of all, I'd like to highlight our next two speakers who are going to be coming up on the 12th of October and 26th of October. In fact, our speaker for the 12th of October, Chuck Robbins, is right here. Chuck, And Chuck uh, served two tours in Vietnam from 67 to 69 as a medevac dust-off pilot. And if you think anything is an exciting experience, uh, terrifying in many respects, uh, that is exactly what you can imagine. Uh, and again, so Chuck's, well, later on he became a Cobra pilot. And that's an attack helicopter, for those of you who may not know that. So again, that's it's quite, quite a change. Uh, and again, I hope you'll join us for that. And then on 26 October, Flint Whitlock, uh, who's a, been award-winning author and military historian, and also one of our board members, is going to give a talk on one of his books, uh, well, actually, the, this one isn't a book, but it's about Operation Dragoon, which was the invasion of southern France during World War II. And this was in support of the Normandy invasions. Uh, but Flint is a, is a superb historian, so uh, this will be a marvelous talk as well. Uh, in terms of some admin, again, good time to put your cell phones on a mute. Uh, as invariably, uh, we all get a call one way or the other, uh, and uh, we just soon not disturb our, our speakers here. Uh, let's see. Uh, we survive on donations, so uh, you'll see in the back of our little room there, there's a series of jars showing the various services, so you can show your support for your service. Uh, and our museum by putting a little something in there. If nothing else, it helps us pay for our coffee and donuts. Uh, we're always looking for volunteers who can help us at the museum, so if any of you have an interest in some time, uh, we'd love to talk with you about this. And I guess the last thing I was asked to mention, you probably saw our little card here on each of the chairs here. And this is our local VFW post. And Lou, Moy, or Lou Roman gave me this. Uh, and it's uh, just an invitation to stop by for a free beer, which sounds pretty good to me anyway. Uh, anytime on Wednesday to Friday, 3 p.m. to last call. So, um, you know, please stop by, visit them. Uh, another good group. So, before we kind of pass on, I'd like to turn it over to John, who will finish off our introductions. Good morning and uh, welcome. I'm John Petacolis. Uh, I am uh, currently the commander of American Legion Post 58. If uh, you don't know, American Post 58 meets here on the second Thursday of the evening at 6.30. Uh, in the evening. We are a service organization. We are not a bar. We're not a restaurant. We provide service to our local community, to our local veterans, and to our local youth. So that's, I wanted to throw that out right away. Um, and we also welcome uh, all you veterans out there. If you're uh, interested and so inclined, uh, we're a volunteer group. Uh, we do a lot of volunteer activities for our youth and our veterans. And like I said, uh, please come to a meeting <coughs> Thursdays, 6.30 p.m. We'd love to have you. Uh, the reason I'm talking this morning primarily is uh, I want to talk to you and any, I see some children in the audience, uh, if you have any uh, grandkids or uh, kids, 
we are having a, at noon today, right here as we speak, uh, we're going to have a little program for about an hour on various scholarships available to high school students uh, here in the local area. These are all mostly veteran organizations provided scholarships from the American Legion, from the VFW Post 9565. Uh, we have some from the uh, uh, Public Health Service. Uh, we have some uh, other uh, scholarships that we're going to enumerate. I also have uh, Jace Johnson, who is the local, uh, he's a West Point graduate, he's the local uh, recruiter, I guess, I can't remember the exact title, but a recru recruiter for West Point, and he talks about all the uh, military academies. He'll be also here for anybody that has any questions on military academies. So I'd like to invite you to that. At noon today, it'll only be about an hour. <clears throat> uh, now, I'd like to introduce Pat Crotty. Pat Crotty is a member of American Legion Post 58, and uh, we, he is a 30-year career U.S. Air Force and uh, United States Public Health Service uh, officer. Uh, he is a uh, retired 06, correct? Right. Yep. Retired 06, which I'm not sure if it's a captain in the... Uh, captain. Okay, so you got it's it. not a, even though he's in the Air Force, not a, not a colonel. He's a bigger captain. He's a, he's a bigger captain. I've been a captain twice. There you go. <laughs> anyway, I'd like to introduce uh, Pat, and he'll be uh, giving this, the uh, talk today. I don't, I don't need this one. Oh, he's, got, he's already wired. I'm thank good. you, John, right. and thank you all for coming. This will be a little bit different, I think, day for you. Uh, yes, I had some time with the Air Force, so I do have some uh, armed services experience. But most of what I'm going to talk about today has to do with the Public Health Service. And the reason for that is very few people know about the Public Health Service. So uh, it is a uniform service. There are seven of them. And uh, Public Health Service is uh, the largest of the ones that is not military. Uh, the other one is uh, about 300 officers with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Public Health Service has about 6,500. Um, I'm going to start with a little bit about my own background, talk for about 10 minutes about uh, my experience with the Air Force, and then I'm going to have to backtrack. I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of medicine, because that leads into what the Public Health Service is all about. And I titled the, the talk today, A, a Continuous uh, uh, Effort in Progress, and that's for a reason that uh, medical knowledge continues to increase at an enormous rate. But when you see what it was like four or 500 years ago, it was an enormous contrast. So we'll talk about that. I'll talk about the Public Health Service as it exists today, focusing on the Commission Corps, and then I'll talk about my assignments with the Public Health Service. So right. <coughs> uh, to get started, I want to introduce a few people here. My wife, Wanda, my son, Sean, Daughter-in-law, Carrie. What would I call you? I guess a granddaughter, huh? <laughs> That's Katie. And Katie is going to be doing some artwork for uh, Post 58 soon. And this is Finn. And uh, I appreciate you guys coming. So my own background. I was born in Massachusetts a long time ago. And uh, uh, born into a, a family of immigrants. Uh, my mother uh, came over from Poland as a child, came through Ellis Island where they went through the immigration uh, investigation and uh, uh, she was allowed in, which was good, but she spoke Polish much of her life. My dad's family came from Ireland and they came via uh, Newfoundland. And oftentimes they would be uh, moving back and forth he was third generation, but in Massachusetts, we were a relatively poor family. We didn't have a car. Uh, there was five children. We all went to work at an early age. I started uh, full-time when I was eight years old, picking fruits and vegetables in farmer's fields for 50 cents an hour. I'd come home and I'd give my dad a $20 bill. He'd give me back a one, and that was my spending money. So I learned early on, you got to work. 
and to get anywhere. And uh, at any rate, the one thing my folks really focused on is get an education. And a couple of my siblings and myself did. I was very fortunate to go to the University of Massachusetts, got a degree in civil engineering, and then got a scholarship to stay on for another year to get a master's degree in environmental engineering. And that's what prepared me for the military. Um, it was Vietnam time when I got out of school. And I went and asked my draft board, uh, what's in it for me? And they said, well, uh, you're probably going to be drafted in February or March of next year. This was about this time of year. Uh, I had been married a year earlier. My wife and I talked it over. Uh, we decided we didn't want to, me to get drafted. So I had spent two years with ROTC, got in touch with the commander of the detachment there, and he put me in touch with uh, the Bioenvironmental Engineering Corps in the Air Force. And they had a wonderful assignment for me. I was going to work with McDonnell Douglas Aircraft in uh, Los Angeles on what was called the Manned Orbital Laboratory. Manned Orbital Laboratory, the Mole Project, the predecessor of what is now the International Space Station. And I would have been working there uh, with a team of people on how to recycle water. You don't keep no water supplies in space, so you've got to bring what you're going to use with you. You've got to consume it, use it, and then recycle it, treat it, so that it's usable again. So I was really excited about that. About a month later, I got my orders. My orders said Grand Forks Air Force Base, North Dakota. <laughs> uh, I was a little surprised by that. So I called the, the major I had worked with. He says, Lieutenant, he says, uh, just for your information, President Nixon just signed into law uh, a new program, a new agency for the government called NASA. All of the space programs that had been with the Air Force, the Army, the Navy, were given over to NASA to give it a jump start. So they have no need for you anymore. So I was assigned to SAC for three years. And uh, it was a, actually a good career. Uh, the Air Force sent me to school for a semester of postgraduate work at the Brooks School of Aerospace Medicine, where I studied uh, public health, industrial hygiene, and one of the large areas was radiation control. And then I uh, spent uh, my three years or two and a half years left at Grand Forks doing consulting work at uh, K.I. Sawyer Air Force Base along the Dew Line and for the base there. The duties there were, I had a staff of about six and uh, they were all public health technicians and they, would, they were very good at what they did. They would go out and do all kinds of survey work in the shops, on the flight line, that sort of thing. And when they came up with a problem, uh, it then became my issue to try and find a way to deal with that problem and correct things. So I got to work with the uh, base commander, the chief civil engineer, the commander of a missile wing, uh, Minuteman II at the time, and a bomb wing and that sort of thing. Gave me a lot of experience and a lot of good confidence. At the end of uh, about two and a half years in, the Air Force says to me, uh, we'd like you to stay. And I felt good about that. And they said, uh, we've got about a dozen assignments that will be open in six months when you would be transferring. Uh, you can take a look at them and let us know what you'd like. Well, one of them was Wiesbaden in Germany. And it was an environmental health lab that uh, served not just the Air Force, but all the military for Europe. <coughs> Excuse me. And I said, I'll take it. And they said, you got it. And I said, could I have my written orders? And they said, oh, no, we won't give you your written orders until about a month before you're going to transfer. Uh -oh. And I said, I don't think so. You got me once, but you're not getting me twice. So uh, at that point, uh, we decided we were going to go back to the Northeast, and I would look for work there. My wife was a nurse. She had no trouble finding work wherever we went. So anyhow, we went back and uh, I did some interviewing, had some job offers, 
But they, we decided that we really liked the West. Neither one of us had traveled as children, and we wanted to come back out West. So I got in touch with a friend of mine who was with the Public Health Service, and uh, he says, yeah, well, there's always openings. So I got in touch with the headquarters group, and they had openings with Indian Health Service in Arizona. And uh, that was the start of the next 27 years that I'll get into. Now, the Public Health Service, I'm just going to briefly talk about a couple of things here. The emblem here, this is the Caduceus of Mercury, and Mercury was a Roman god. Uh, the saying went that if you were exposed to that staff, you would have an easy death. Now, how the heck health got involved with an easy death is beyond me. It just never has fit, but that's what that's about. This is a fouled anchor, and that was a symbol of uh, sailors in, di in distress. And we'll talk about the origins of the uh, service, and you'll understand that. Now, the yellow flag, uh, those of you with the Navy, uh, the Coast Guard may recognize that. Uh, that is flown, and it has been since the early 1700s, as a, a sign of a ship in quarantine in the harbor. When a ship would come in with a lot of six sailors on board, uh, instead of allowing it into port where the diseases could be, could just ravage the local population, instead they would put the ship out in the harbor at anchor with a yellow flag flying for 40 days. At the end of the 40 days, if things were better, they allowed people ashore. Uh, during that period of time, they didn't just leave them there. They gave them better foodstuffs and helped them with cleanliness and clothing and that sort of thing. And they may probably had uh, doctors go on board the ship as well. But that's what the significance of that yellow flag is. In order to prepare for this, um, when Mike asked me to do this talk, I knew very little about the Public Health Service, even though I had served with it for 27 years. And there's a reason for that. Many of us serve as lone rangers, so we go out and do uh, an assignment, but we have no support group. We're assigned to another agency and often work uh, under the direction of senior people in that agency and so forth. And the Public Health Service is involved in so many things that it's very difficult to know much about it. So I went in and went into the website, which is very, very informative, and then had two books uh, that are shown here, and I've got copies of those I'll be leaving uh, for the uh, museum here, for their library, that you may want to borrow if you uh, have an interest in what I have to say. And keep in mind that um, these books are written kind of like investigative reports for the news media, so they're, they're pretty good reads, they're pretty interesting. Now, many of the questions you probably have are about the Commission Corps. So I'm going to start with just a few comments about that to introduce what the Public Health Service Commission Corps is all about. It's an officers only corps, although the law does allow for uh, warrant officers, they've never choose, chosen to commission any. Um, Grades are ensign through full admiral. I was a captain when I, well, for many years and then when I retired. The uniforms we wear are essentially Navy uniforms, and you'll see that in the next slide. Uh, about 6,500 officers on duty at any point in time. Uh, all of us, almost all, have either a degree in a medical science, doctors, dentists, veterinarians, nurses or in a public health area like myself. Sanitary engineering, uh, public health specialties, that sort of thing. We often get asked if we qualify as veterans. And there's a little story behind this because yes, we do. In fact, I, I have paperwork saying I'm a veteran both of public health service and of the Air Force. But the Veterans Administration that we know today actually started as an agency of the Public Health Service. And it was spun off after, well actually it was created and spun off 
in about 1920, and it was to deal with the soldiers coming back from uh, World War I who had all kinds of physical injuries, but also had a lot of what was called shell shock at the time. Post-traumatic stress disorder would be uh, the diagnosis today. So yes, we qualify as veterans. In fact, uh, we formed the organization. Uh, Public Health Service used to have a reserve force of about 10,000 officers. Uh, they did away with that about 15 or 20 years ago and substituted a deployment force. The deployment force is officers who are on active duty but are trained so they can be called at a minute's notice, put together in a group to go out and do relief activities, usually uh, called by FEMA. Whoops, I'll get into that in a minute. Um, this is public health service uniform. This was back in about 1982. Uh, I had just been promoted to commander at the time. The guy on the left is not in a public health service uniform, <laughs> so please don't get confused by that. Um, but he's important, because that's what a doctor looked like for wealthy people back about 500 years ago. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about the history of medicine, but this fellow, you might say, well, what's this mask he's wearing? Well, it sets the stage what I'll be talking about. 500 years ago, I'll put it mildly, people stunk. Um, cleanliness was not of order. Uh, people didn't have indoor plumbing. They didn't have good drinking water. Uh, the streets around them were uh, full of fecal material. It was just a messy, messy place. And as urbanization increased, people moved into city areas for work and stuff. It just got worse. That mask was held either perfume or eucalyptus leaves or mint leaves or rose petals to mask the odor for this doctor when he'd go into a room like this with sick people. So that gives you an idea of just how far in 500 years medicine has come. Uh, back then they believed in what was called the theory of humors. And this is how you did medical care. People had four serums in their body, yellow bile, black bile, saliva, and blood. And they felt that if those things got out of balance in the body, people were ill. So the way you dealt with it is you bled them, or you caused them to vomit, to try and bring those humors back into balance. It didn't work very well, but this was the way that uh, medicine was practiced right up until the Civil War time. Now, Public Health Service started 1798 as the Marine Hospital Service. Uh, this is just a drawing of, I think, a second generation hospital in Boston Harbor, and I think this is a museum these days. You can see it from the harbor. But uh, 1798, federal, our country is now, what, 22 years old, and the federal government is having all kinds of problems dealing with disease that's being brought into our country by sailors, merchant marine, navy, what was then the revenue cutter service, predecessor to the Coast Guard, and these people would come in and they'd have, they'd have been in foreign ports where they were exposed to diseases that were not common here. And to give an example of how serious this was, the population of indigenous people in the Americas decreased by 90% between the time of the first Spanish uh, settlers and about the year 1800, over a 300 year period. 90% of, of the local population died off. Well, that was still going on because most of the people in the colonies were European. But the people doing the uh, merchant marine service were going to Africa, Asia, other places to find things to bring in here as trade goods. And as a result, they were bringing a lot of disease. So the federal government put together the Marine Hospital Service, but the states didn't want it. The country back then 
with states' rights. So many of the states would not accept these, these new hospitals. Only five did. Boston, Charleston, Norfolk, uh, uh, Norfolk and uh, surprisingly, New Orleans. And there's one other I always lose track of. But those hospitals uh, were staffed with local people who knew a little bit about medicine of the time, but the quality of medical care varied from New, from New England to Florida to New Orleans based upon the skills of the people who were providing that care. Hmm. Okay, this is a different slide series, but I'll go back and just talk it through. Um, in the mid-1840s, uh, there were some major advances in medical science. Um, it became the area of what was called germ theory of uh, medicine. Uh, microscopes had been developed, the first one in Sweden in about 1590. And uh, using that, people could take a look, educated people, at flies or fleas and see hairs on the legs and really see things that the naked eye couldn't see. And they became real excited about that. One guy, a few years later, took and polished one of these lenses so finely, we're still talking a single lens magnifying glass, that he could see and magnify things about 270 times. In drinking water, in a drop of water, he could see organisms floating around, all looking identical. And he didn't know what this was, but it was an advance. Well, about that time, uh, other educated people were picking up on this new microscope, and they were examining milk. Louis Pasteur and wine, and finding that as the milk spoiled, there was more of these similar organisms uh, in the milk, heavier concentrations of it. There was a guy in, in Germany who went the next step, and he took and he found that uh, if you took the blood out of a horse and you compared it to uh, that you would see little organisms in that blood. And he didn't really know what it was, but if a, a horse without anthrax didn't have those organisms. One with anthrax did. Then he went and he looked at tuberculosis. He found people with tuberculosis had an organism in their blood that was a different size and shape. The same thing with cholera. So the next step was somebody in London took that information about cholera, and they found that in this area of the city where there was an enormous outbreak of cholera, the people who had this organism in their blood were the ones who were ill. So then he went and tested the water in the well. He found the same organism in the water. So this was the first connection between a cause and effect of germ uh, the germ theory of, of public health. I'll make a comment here because public health service is not a, an armed service, it's not a military service, but it has been in a war against germs constantly ever since. Okay. Okay, this fellow here, this is post-Civil War times now. This is, guy was a general uh, medical doctor working under the direction of General Sherman on the march to the sea through Georgia. And uh, his credentials were, he had been a pharmacist, he went back, got a medical degree, and uh, after that, in serving with uh, Sherman, he ran the ambulance service. And during that whole one-year campaign, they never lost a person to death while they were in one of his ambulances. So after the war, he, came, he was revered, and he was appointed as the first supervising Surgeon General of what was still at that time the Marine Hospital Service. And uh, what he did is having been in the military, he said, 
I don't like this with ha having only physicians in the service because we know now that a lot of this stuff could be prevented if we had cleaner environment, clean and drinking water. So he started hiring people like myself with a sanitary engineering background, uh, although they didn't know, call them sanitary engineers at the time. Um, he also said, I don't want doctors who are appointed politically. I want doctors who know what they're doing. So he started to examine the doctors. And the story goes, of the first year, he examined 47 doctors who wanted to come into the public health service or the Marine Hospital Service at the time. He only selected three. So the quality of service now and the quality of the people offering the services were increasing and improving as well. Uh, during this period of time, he also put all of his physicians into uniform. He put doctors onto the revenue cutters, so instead of the ships having to come in for medical care, there was now medical care available to them on, on board. And uh, during this period of time then, uh, this was a major move. There was a major outbreak of yellow fever in New Orleans. And yellow fever is a nasty disease, but it was one that kind of proved the point that uh, germs don't know any boundaries. And what happened was uh, the yellow fever outbreak bro uh, broke out and it moved up the Mississippi River with the shipping up the river all the way almost up to Minneapolis-St. Paul all over the course of a couple months. And this told the states, germs don't recognize boundaries, we really do need a federal government role in public health and that really advanced the efforts of the Marine Hospital Service. It became the Public Health and Marine Hospital Service in 1902, and then it became the Public Health Service that we know today in uh, 1912. Okay, so I'm gonna move into Public Health Service today. This is, uh, 65,000 employees in Health and Human Services. Uh, the Public Health Service works directly for the Assistant Secretary for Health, and it has responsibility for eight of those 11 programs. The three that it doesn't, although it does have offices assigned to the three, are Medicare, Medicaid, and a group of uh, other uh, insurance type of programs for children and, and women. Um, I put down this little comment here about the Affordable Care Act because uh, back in 1798, when the Marine Hospital Service was first formed, uh, sailors earned about three bucks a month. That was what the average pay was. They had 20 cents deducted from that in order to get care in those Marine Hospital Service hospitals. And that was the first government insurance way back in uh, the 1700s. Well, the Affordable Care Act halved or more than halved the number of people who didn't have uh, health insurance back in 2010. Uh, that number has remained relatively stable. It's probably a few more uh, who don't have insurance now because of some of the changes to the Affordable Care Act. But um, public health services always favored um, medical insurance for everybody. And they've always lobbied for that. But they've always lobbied with uh, having the pharmaceutical industry, the American Medical Association, and other groups that have an interest in health treatment uh, combating them, and it has never, never really come about. Public Health Service today, 65 1,000 uh, total, 6,500 Commission Corps, and the Commission offices almost exclusively have degrees either in medical treatment or in preventive medicine. And I mentioned how sometimes we operate as, as uh, Lone Rangers. These are the major agencies that the Public Health Service serves today. Uh, Indian Health Service, uh, health care for Indians, 570 plus tribes, uh, there's other state-recognized tribes as well. There's some who claim to be tribes that no 
government agency recognizes yet. National Institutes of Health. This is where uh, all of the research goes into advancing health needs, either through in-house exploration or through grants to states and universities and that sort of thing. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. If you get your flu shot, it's going to have been made by CDC. If uh, all vaccines in this country come through or are approved by CDC. Uh, if you go online and look for the number of conditions that people have, um, illnesses and that sort of thing, back in the days of when the Marine Hospital Service was formed, uh, colonial days, there might have been 15 or 20 that doctors at the time could give a name to, tuberculosis, cholera, typhoid, things of that nature. Online on their catalog today, almost 13,000. So healthcare has really come a long ways in the last couple of centuries. Food and Drug Administration, PHS, uh, is part of that to assure that the food we eat and the uh, drugs and medicines we use are, are safe. And then these other agencies have similar uh, missions, but they're a lot smaller. I'm not going to get into the details of them. Now, in addition, in addition to that, Public Health Service puts offices out in a lot of other federal agencies that are not part of Health and Human Services. This is just a few of them. The Environmental Protection Agency I served for 19 years with. Uh, Federal Bureau of Prisons, health care for uh, prisoners and staff, Department of Defense Psychological Health Program, uh, Public Health Service uh, has a full program that deals with investigations into uh, the causes and treatments of uh, post-traumatic stress disorder and other uh, psychological illnesses. Homeland Security, FEMA, uh, I'll talk in just a minute about that, but also the Coast Guard gets their health care from Public Health Service. Um, Department of Agriculture, if there's a leafy lettuce illness that comes out, usually around E. coli or something like that, uh, Public Health Service goes in to help agriculture with figuring out what caused it and how to deal with it. Uh, NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, this is the Weather Service. PHS does the uh, health care for the 300 officers there. The National Park Service, all of the uh, facilities there are either designed by PHS, they're not constructed by, and that's usually done by contract. If there's a problem with health care within the, uh, one of the parks, Public Health Service goes in to uh, help the Park Service with resolving it. And then the Marshall Service, I'm not really sure what it is here. Uh, there's something to do with, uh, they have special forces, much like some of the uniformed services do, kind of hush-hush, and uh, the Public Health Service provides medical care for them as well. Um, I'm going to go back up here to FEMA and Homeland Security. Public Health Service, when I talked about the deployment activities, they will send people out for uh, hurricane relief. They provide uh, doctors and nurses for the Navy's uh, Comfort and Mercy ships, which are both hospital ships. When 9-11, uh, the terrorist activity in 9-11, Public Health Service sent about 1,000 people in to help with medical care in the community, but also with recovery activities after the, the event. Um, so Public Health Service gets involved very deeply with emergency response activities. I'm going to shift now to a little bit about my tour with PHS. I mentioned early on that I started with the Indian Health Service. Uh, I was assigned in Phoenix, Arizona, and uh, the yellow areas here on the map show uh, Indian lands in Arizona. Uh, over in Southern California, the reservation areas are called rancheras. They're much smaller, but they're very numerous as well. Well, I served, um, not sure, I served in this area all the way up through here and down into the Grand Canyon. And uh, just going to 
talk a bit about what we did there. This was called the Sanitation Facilities Construction Program. It was a preventive health care program for the Indian tribes where they lagged in uh, drinking water treatment, they lagged in wastewater disposal, and we would go in and build facilities for them uh, to improve the conditions. Now, this is a typical house on the uh, Gila River Reservation back in, say, the late 60s, early 70s. Pat, yes. Yes. a little closer to the screen so we can get you in the pictures in. Oh, okay, sure. You mean I'm, out of the, I'm not in the picture? <laughs> okay, well, I'll tell you what, I'll just kind of sit down then. <laughs> uh, this is a typical house on the reservation back in the early 70s, and uh, it's small. It's uh, very inexpensively built using local materials and all. And these folks wanted water and sewer. Well, this is out on the desert now. So in order to get drinking water that was safe and plentiful, we had to drill down about 600 feet. And uh, that meant we couldn't drill an individual well for each of these houses. They were spaced out sometimes several hundred feet apart. So we'd have to drill one community well and then distribute the water out through small piping. And the, probably the largest we use were occasionally three inch, but usually two inch PVC, that's the white plastic piping. And uh, so the pressures weren't very high. We had a stand pipe or sometimes used a pneumatic uh, pressure system. Uh, but once we got water to the house, uh, we had to find a way to deal with uh, the waste disposal. So it meant subsurface sewage disposal for each of these houses had to be constructed as well. Well, the law that we worked under only allowed us to provide 50 gallons of water per person per day. Now, in communities outside the reservation, 20 miles away, engineers were designing for 200 gallons per person per day, sometimes even more. So these systems, once we got them into place, um, people discovered what are called evaporative coolers. Anyone familiar with those? Evaporative coolers use a lot of water, especially if you don't recycle the water. Indians couldn't afford to recycle the water, so they just ran water through it. And in the summertime, these systems ran out of water by 10 in the morning every day with the pump running 24 hours a day. The wells were designed to only operate 10 hours a day. So this created a real public health issue for us because you would get backflow into the system which could be contaminated and then you'd be sending the contamination out again. There we go, heading in the right direction. Okay, well eventually, uh, Public Health Service and the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the Department of Housing and Urban Development got together and they said, we've got to do a better job of this. And uh, we'll put our resources together. The BIA will lay out a subdivision, much like would be done around here today. Uh, they'd build the roads and lay out the lots. We would come in and put in a water and sewer system for the community. HUD would come in and build the houses like this. This has taken a few years after that was built, but you see the evaporative cooler up on top of the house. We were still providing 50 gallons per person per day. So now you got these nice subdivisions, but they're running out of water too. So this became a real issue for us over time. And what it did for me is it kind of angered me and uh, I decided to take on some work. Sean and his sister were very young at the time. They were in bed early. And uh, I started doing an engineering report for the entire reservation, 11 communities, um, and put it together. But when I sent it to PHH headquarters, they didn't want to sign off on it because it contradicted the law. And it took a lot of arguing to get that thing signed. But once it was, the tribe used it when they went before Congress uh, to help get past what was called the Indian Self-Determination Act. And uh, that brought some relief to the tribes. 
If you go onto a reservation today, you'll find communities just like this, where things are a whole lot different than they were when I first worked there in the 1970s. Part of it is because of the Indian Self-Determination Act. Another big contributing factor is what was called the Indian Gaming Act of 1988. And that allowed the tribes to put in casinos. Casinos make a lot of money, five, six, seven percent per year of whatever's bet. So the tribes have come a long way, many of them, uh, in the last couple of decades. I'm going to contrast what I've done here with one of the tribes I worked with way up north in Arizona. This is uh, the Havasupai tribe. And this is just a little drawing of uh, how you get into Supai Village. This is a village of about 600 Indians. Um, it's in the Grand Canyon. So you're going to see something quite different than what you saw down on the desert. But the trailhead here uh, is at Wallapai Hilltop. This is on the Wallapai Indian Reservation. It's about 60 miles north of Interstate 40. At the time I worked there, it was a dirt road, not a gravel road, a dirt road. So it took a while to get out just to this point. From here, winding your way down to the village is eight miles. In the process, you drop 2,200 feet, 2,200 feet. So it's quite a hike, especially this portion of it, which is very steep. It's Pathways that are five feet wide, no guardrails, no fencing. Some of those drop-offs are two or three hundred feet. So we couldn't get equipment down this way. We had to hike in with a backpack. We'd be down, you know, our clothing and stuff to be down there for a few days. Or the tribe, if we arranged ahead of time, would send out uh, horses. And uh, if they thought you were a tenderfoot, and I'm coming from New England, they did me the first time they gave me a mule with a wet saddle. And, uh, but I used to ride horseback when I was a kid, so it, I knew how best to deal with that, but they thought they got me, but they didn't. But anyhow, uh, we would go down, and that community is like this. A little different than what I showed you on the uh, reservation for the desert area. It's in the Grand Canyon. This water tank, the bigger one here, is one that I had constructed many years ago. This was taken about 10 years ago. The houses, again, are uh, local build. There are some newer ones down there now. This is a helicopter pad. This is how we got materials into the uh, canyon for our construction projects. This community had individual sewage disposal, one community well serving the whole uh, community, but they had decent pressure because you've got, you know, a couple of hundred, you know, 150 feet of pressure there. That's actually very good pressure. We had to reduce it. Um, between the village and the Colorado River, another four miles, so eight miles plus the four, 12 mile hike, you get down to the Colorado River. Below the, the community and up to the river, you pass four waterfalls of this nature. This is the nicest. This is Mooney Falls. And uh, the tribe knew all about this, and we used to go down there when we, in the evening. But uh, beautiful, beautiful terrain, uh, and the tribe has benefited from that by putting in hiking trails, and tourism has become a big deal for them. So again, they kind of do the best they can with, with what's available to them. We had a fly of materials in, and I'll tell you one quick story about this. A friend of mine, um, I think he was the engineer there before me, was flying in fiberglass septic tanks for subsurface sewage disposal. And there were three of them strung out underneath the chopper, and uh, they took off the mesa, and this is several hundred foot drop now into the, into the uh, landing area and they lost lift. So the helicopter pilot, yeah, he got rid of the load, he ejected the load. One of those uh, fiberglass septic tanks hit a steer. So now those of you who have worked with the government in other areas, 
it's hard to commit the government to a thousand dollar payback <laughs> in, a, in arrears. So it took him almost a year to get this guy the payments approved to get this Indian fellow uh, paid back for the loss of that steer. But that story went around the area office for some time. It was just a unique situation. Okay, tour with EPA. I'm going to talk about this one, just the next two, just very briefly. Even though I spent 19 years here, uh, this was a typical federal agency. Uh, Region 8 here in Denver operates around the six states here. The yellow areas, the Indian lands, all of the EPA programs on Indian lands were, and I still think are, uh, operated by uh, the area office here in Denver. Uh, most of the programs we dealt with, we could delegate to the states. We could give them uh, a grant money on an annual basis for, for them to build a program that met or exceeded uh, federal requirements. And most of them chose to do that over time. Uh, with the exception of, for the programs I worked with, State of Wyoming has never adopted a drinking water program, and that continues to be run out of uh, Denver. Um, when I first got there, I worked with the worst wastewater construction program, and this one dealt with putting in, uh, helping communities uh, around the nation improve waste disposal, and it was a multi-billion dollar a year program. I had 65 projects in Utah that I worked with, and my role was dealing with uh, uh, making sure that the, the project that the city wanted to put on was actually appropriate, and then working with their engineers to design it, then inspecting the construction, and then making sure the, the uh, community put it into operation. I did that for about a year, and then the Safe Drinking Water Act uh, came into prominence, and uh, I went to work with drinking water and underground injection control. Uh, UIC, underground injection, oil and gas. Much of the operation is oil and gas. And uh, in that particular field, uh, they, when you develop and pull up gas and oil, even from the wells that are being done today using fracking, you're pulling up some pretty vile stuff. You need to get rid of it. So you inject it deeper underground, below drinking water, use, usable aquifers, usually a couple miles deep. And uh, that program has been a big one. It's been delegated to most of these states, often in two increments. One increment for oil and gas goes to the Oil and Gas Commission in the state. The other one for more public health uh, oriented activities like hazardous waste injection, that goes uh, with the health department normally. Um, as time went on, by the early 90s, I had a staff of over 70 people working on those two program areas, and I wanted to do something a little bit different. I had the, op I had the opportunity to do what is called bait bucket transfer. Anyone have boat? Uh, if you have a boat, you go into a lake area, and what do they want you to do? They want to inspect the boat. They want to make sure it doesn't have mussels or other kind of organisms on it. The reason for that is um, from one watershed to another, the species of life there differ. And if you bring a life form into a, a watershed where it doesn't, isn't native, then it can flourish because there's no predators for it. And that causes enormous problems. One of the biggest was up on the Great Lakes where shipping from China brought in what is called a zebra mussel. That zebra mussel has screwed up water systems in Canada and the US for decades now and continues to. And uh, anyhow, this bait bucket transfer program was an international commission I was the representative for the U.S., uh, Canada had representatives, uh, all of the northern tier of states had representatives, and the southern tier of Canadian provinces. And we would work with specific issues, but also how to minimize the problems with bait bucket transfer. 
The other, last thing I worked on for a period of about six months was enforcement. We had tremendous enforcement authority with the Safe Drinking Water Act. $10,000 per day of violation. And some utilities, if they're in violation, they might be in violation of five or 10 things. So it's $100,000 a day. And we used to file suit against them for $100,000 a day. And that raised all kinds of trouble for us in the media. But we had to do that. And it really happened because we would spend years with training programs, coaching on site with the utility, how to do a better job of it. But there were always a few that were just going to push the envelope. And those we would go after. And once they got the message, we'd negotiate. They'd pay a penalty, but it wasn't what I was talking about. We'd be reasonable for what they could afford. But this usually brought them into compliance, but it also sent a message to others that it's better to come into compliance on your own than have to do it eventually anyhow and pay a fine. Well, because of that, some of the other programs in the region didn't use their enforcement authority very effectively. So I wound up as a coordinator for all the regional programs to help them with improving their enforcement. Um, my last assignment, yep, my last assignment was with the American Water Works Association. Anybody here from utility operations to where it was last time? Um, even as we had to go after some people and file enforcement actions, many of the larger utilities, Denver for instance, uh, Broomfield would probably fall into that, although I don't know specifically, uh, wanted to go way beyond the law because the law set minimum standards and they wanted to do a better job of serving their customers. And as a result, they wanted to put together a, a series of programs that would allow them to help one another to do that. Well, I knew the executive director of AWWA and the deputy, uh, they, one of them had been a public health service officer. In fact, he was the one who dropped the uh, septic tanks in Supai Canyon. But uh, we put together a program uh, with volunteers and I went to work with them um, as a, I guess you'd call it, I was assigned by the public health service, but they paid half of my salary. So the public health service is very broad and has a lot of authorities, and that was one of them uh, to allow me to do this. So I was truly a lone ranger while I was out there for four years. What we put together were four programs called self-assessment, <coughs> peer review, metric and process benchmarking. And uh, these were programs that the utilities themselves uh, bought into. They helped design them and they were costly to them. Self-assessment would cost a utility $10,000 or so. Uh, peer review maybe as much as $40,000. And uh, as a result, the utilities that were interested in do those two parts of the program probably had petered out by about 2010, about 15 years after we started the program. But these other two, metric and process benchmarking, live on today, and they still cost the utility a good amount of money to participate in, but they also get, continue to get good benefits back from that. Um, eventually, AWWA was uh, drinking water only, but a lot of the utilities we worked with were both drinking water and um, wastewater oriented. So as time went on, they wanted us to do this for the wastewater side as well. We enlisted support from the Water Environment Federation and that's uh, uh, expanded the program so it covered both. So there's, there's a history of who I am. And I hope I haven't bored you too much with that. But I'm going to finish with just a couple of comments. Uh, there are opportunities for the younger folks here or for any of you who have uh, grandchildren or children who might be interested in uh, public health service career. And uh, these are grant kind of programs. Uh, they will fun function somewhat uh, differently and they're down here. There are others of them that come into play periodically 
depending on the public health service needs. But COSTEP stands for Commission Officer Student Extern Program. And essentially what this is, if you have somebody who's in college in a degree program that would be useful to the public health service, they can apply for a temporary commission as an ensign. And uh, their travel money would be paid. They would be brought out to work with a commission officer uh, for maybe summer vacation between semesters. And during that period of time, they get paid as an ensign. Travel money is paid back and forth both ways. And a great opportunity for people to experience public health service uh, before they commit to it. I had one of those folks assigned to me when I was with Indian Health Service. Um, the U.S. Uniformed Services University School of Medicine, that'd be for people, physicians and nurses and so forth who are actually on duty. This National Health Services Corps is a scholarship program and it is um, established because we have certain underserved areas of the country. They could be rural, they could be urban, but it's where health care, preventive health is, uh, care is difficult to get. And what happens here is these people, if they're accepted into it, get a scholarship, a four-year scholarship. And then when they're done uh, with their schooling, they owe the public health service. I think it's one year per year, but that can vary depending on the program. So anyhow, if you have people who are uh, interested in college or uh, you might want to put them on in touch with usphs.gov. And with that, I'm going to quit. Any questions? Uh, please, if you have any questions, please uh, raise your hand. I would ask you to use our little microphone here. Yes, Chip. Uh, do you have something to say about Joseph Lister and antiseptic surgery? Oh, wow. <laughs> Jim, is that, did they plant you with that? <laughs> no, I don't. I, okay. I, I am not a doctor, and I don't want All to. Right. Uh, okay. But go he's, ahead. If he's you an have. ancestor of mine. And in 1867, he discovered that... Um, uh, antiseptic surgery. Uh, before that, like all through the Civil War, anybody who got operated on would usually get inf an infection, sepsis, uh, because they didn't really, the, the knowledge of what germs were didn't make it to the battlefield. That's right. So uh, he discovered that he's an English guy, and in 1867, two years late, discovered antiseptic surgery. He used a material called phenol which is a de derivative of creosote, but it actually um, it, um, sanitized or disinfected the instruments and the operating theater, and he had a, remark a remarkable decrease in sepsis and infection from people who got operated on then. <laughs> Amazing, yeah. Okay. That, that is interesting, and you know, there's so many little increments of creeping forward. It was back in those days where laudanum was first being used instead of just alcohol for uh, making patients more comfortable when they were being operated on and all. And I mentioned germ theory when I focused on bacteria. But if you look at the first viruses were, the, the person giving credit for that was in about 1892. But it wasn't a virus was never seen under a microscope until electron microscopes were developed in the 1930s. So there's, there's, it's a continual work in progress. And even as we stand here and sit here, uh, people are out there investigating and making advances in uh, public health science. Pat, uh, you know, in recent years, we've seen quite a lot of discussion and push to downsize the size of government, particularly yep. the federal. Do you see that uh, as a threat or you know, downsizing occurring within the public health service? Well, you know, that's a good question, Mike. And um, yes, and it's, a, it's happened more than once. Uh, under President Reagan, uh, when I was in service, there were about 73 or 400 officers on duty. It went down to about 6,000, now it's back up to 6,500. Um, 
but yes, that is something that there's always these kind of investigations going on. And smaller organizations are the ones that are easiest to cut because they don't bring about that much rebuttal from the general public. So public health service has been through that many times, but there always has been uh, folks who understand the importance of the work they're doing that have uh, prevented that ha from happening. Any other questions? Yes, John. Yeah, I just, <clears throat> just quickly, um, you mentioned FEMA and yes. uh, how the Public Health Service works with FEMA. I know since 9-11, FEMA has evolved uh, completely. 9-11 uh, was one, and then several hurricanes later. Uh, yeah. and, and part of that ev evolution uh, ha in, has involved organization. And uh, I know uh, I do a little work with Civil Air Patrol, and a lot of uh, the organizational work, uh, how it's structured, is now very comparable to FEMA, they could, so that all agencies are working together under the same, not umbrella, but the same organization, or yeah. organizational structure, I should say. Yeah. So can you elaborate on the, because you've, I think, been retired since a lot of that has happened. Since, uh, pretty much since all of it was happened. Yeah, FEMA so was, you touch on that, yeah. Yeah, FEMA was first formed, um, I'm guessing the exact year, but it was, I believe, post 9-11. So early 2000s. And uh, early on, it was a mess. I mean, they were trying to bring together organizing uh, response activities, both at the federal level but also from state level as well. And it took many, many years, or several years, for them to put together a cohesive program. But uh, they do a remarkable job today. They're much quicker, and uh, uh, they have the tentacles out into the various contributing organizations uh, who can do a good job in a short period of time. So I, I don't know the details of what you're saying, but uh, that has happened since I retired. I retired in 99, so I'm older than I look. <laughs> well, any other questions? Pat, just, just a comment. My dad worked for BIA, and he was responsible for construction on the under, under reservations. Yes. Uh, Cheyenne Reservation in, uh, in Lane Beer. And, uh, and then he went, uh, when he retired, before when he died, but he was working in, in Utah, I'm sorry, in, in Nevada. So he was doing, he was working hand in hand with you guys. That's right. Uh, and he would do the actual construction. He was, he was a construction engineer for the, mm -hmm. for the reservation. So interesting, interesting uh, dialogue there. Yeah, we learned from one another. The Bureau uh, actually ran the program that I worked with for a number of years. And uh, it was the tribes looking for self-determination that uh, started to see cutbacks in the Bureau of Indian Affairs and some of those activities going elsewhere. Uh, the Economic, Develop uh, Economic Development Commission or Administration, I think it was, uh, the HUD coming in for housing, uh, Public Health Service coming in to do the kind of work I was speaking of. But BIA and Public Health Service both did something similarly. We had what we called force account. And force account was where you had your own equipment. Ours was usually stuff they were bringing back from Vietnam, so it wasn't always in the greatest shape. But we had a, a construction foreman who was usually an equipment operator. We had a plumber. And then we would hire local people from the tribe to actually construct the facilities so that when they were constructed, they'd have some knowledge of where they were, how they were built, and it would be a step up for them then on how to operate and maintain them. But the Bureau was doing the same kind of approach at that time as well. Yeah, but as you say, he'd, he'd give credit when you're building a house, he'd give credit to 20 bucks an hour for if they were over four. Yeah. And they just showed up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, just before we finish up, how many of you know that the uh, Public Health Service actually has its own official march? I don't. I do. <laughs> well, let's, 
will close out by listening to that. <laughs> do I do I need to stand at attention? You want me to march out? Is that the <laughs> Yeah.